Well, hello again. I finally got my computer back yesterday, but not in time to attempt a talking head video of today's topic. So maybe next week, although I must admit the voiceover is a little bit easier. Anywho, in the meantime, the lectionary reads, readings for this Sunday and next Sunday conclude the saga of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with a focus on Joseph, Jacob's first son with Rachel, although not the firstborn of the family. I'll let you make sense of the family tree of Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel while I explain where we're headed today. The lectionary readings basically explain how it was that the Israelites ended up in Egypt, how they prospered there, and eventually became so numerous as to be a threat to Pharaoh. Although, during the lifetime of Joseph, which we're focused on, they only brought blessing to the Egyptians as well as to the budding nation of Israel. Sadly, the lectionary readings make short shrift of Joseph's amazing life, so I would encourage you to read Genesis chapters 37 through 50 to yourself, uh, because it's a great story with every ingredient to hold your attention. Conspiracy, betrayal, lust, dreams and portents, deeds of daring do, harrowing escapes, and finally, a happy ending. I'm going to paraphrase today's reading because it's quite long and also leaves out some elements that I think are crucial to the story. Once again, we have a tale of parental favoritism. Jacob had 12 sons, but his favorite was Joseph, to whom he gave the famous so-called coat of many colors, although biblical scholars now say a more accurate translation would be a richly ornamented robe or a special coat with long sleeves. In any event, the coat was the physical manifestation of the father's favor, and naturally, this favoritism did not sit well with the other 11 brothers. On top of that, Joseph was a tattletale and brought back bad reports to Jacob about how some of his brothers misbehaved while tending their flocks. And just to add insult to injury, he eagerly told them about a dream he had in which they were all together binding sheaves in the fields when suddenly a great sheaf, that is Joseph, arose and stood upright, while all the other sheaves bowed down before it. How to make yourself really popular, right? And it only got worse when he reported a dream in which the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to him. This dream even upset Jacob, who took it to mean, rightly as it turned out, that both he and his wife and the 11 sons would one day bow before J Joseph. It appears that Joseph was something of a pill as a young man, and his brothers detested him. So one day when they were out with the flocks and Jacob sent Joseph out to check on them, the brothers seized the opportunity to strip him of his precious coat and throw him into a well. When a band of Ishmaelite traders came along on their way to Egypt, the brothers realized they could make some money by selling their brother to them as a slave, which is what they did. And that's how Joseph ended up in Egypt. Then the brothers slaughtered a goat, smeared its blood on the coat, and brought this back to show Jacob as evidence that somehow Joseph must have come to a bad end. Jacob naturally came to the conclusion that Joseph had been devoured by a wild animal and tore his robes. He put on sackcloth and mourned his son for many days. Just for fun, I'd like you to take a look at Ford Maddox Brown's take on this event. Brown was the mentor of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and Brown's style of painting greatly influenced a British group of artists that came to call itself the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood 
of which Rossetti was a founding member. The pre-Raphaelites called for a reform in art, a turn away from the raw realism of Gustave Courbet, for example, and a return to nature, although a highly idealized, carefully manicured nature, with bright, intense colors and lots of detail. We certainly see all of that in abundance here. Every inch of the canvas cries out for attention, from the camel in the upper right to the landscape and fig tree on the left, with a ladder and a foot on it, just to let us know that someone is picking the figs that appear in the still-life basket of figs on the table in the lower left corner. While you're down there, you can admire the daisies that are springing up and the young musician with her lyre. And eventually, your eye will find its way to the dog, sniffing at the bloodstains on the coat that the brothers are showing Jacob as he starts to rend his robes. Each of the brothers is wearing at least one article of clothing or accessory that will demand your attention. Perhaps it's the brother in the middle who is holding the bloody coat. I was fascinated by his necklace with its cowrie shells. But the brother on the right is a study all on his own. I think his highly ornate outfit, replete with an animal pelt, would rival Joseph's coat any day. Even the sandals he holds are extraordinary. I show this to you not really by way of a good example, but by way of contrast. This next version of Joseph's coat being shown to Jacob is by Diego Velazquez, court painter to King Philip IV of Spain during the Spanish Golden Age. He was a contemporary of Rembrandt in Holland, although they never met. Here, things have been deliberately simplified. The walls behind the figures and the floor, with the tiles receding in space in linear perspective, are almost a study in shades of gray abstraction, interrupted only by the muted blues and greens of a distant landscape. Velazquez was relatively new to the court scene when he painted this, and it was painted when King Philip, heeding the advice of the artist Peter Paul Rubens, who had been visiting in Spain, encouraged his court painter to go to Italy with Rubens to study the techniques of the classical greats, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael. In Italy, he discovered a much brighter palette, as well as how to paint linear perspective correctly, as we see here. But he also was allowed to explore the painting of the nude human body, and he is clearly delighting in that in this painting, as you observe the various muscular poses of the three brothers illuminated by a bright light from the left, holding up the coat of Joseph for Jacob to identify. Velazquez made two trips to Italy during his long service to the King of Spain, and both must have been a huge relief and source of inspiration to him. Just think about what a court painter serving at the Spanish court at this time usually had at his subject. Philip, age 19, with the Habsburg jaw and the big lower lip. Philip, age 23. Philip, age 23 again. Philip, age 26 or 27. Philip, age 39. Philip, approaching 50. Queen Mariana, age 18 or 19. The Infanta, or Princess, Maria Teresa, age 13. And here she is, about the same age. She would become the future wife of Louis XIV of France. And these portraits were sent all over Europe uh, to uh, perk the interest of possible suitors. Here's another Infanta, or Princess. This one, Margarita Teresa, age 2. And here, as she appears in Las Meninas, Velázquez's masterpiece, she's about age five, with King Philip and Queen Mariana 
far away in the mirror, in the background. Velazquez has turned the royal portrait on its head, featuring himself and the Meninas, the uh, attendants of the princess, the two dwarves on the right, and other members of the household in the background. Indeed, it's kind of the world on its head. Here we see uh, Margarita Teresa, about age eight. Here she is, age nine. Here we have Balthazar Carlos with a dwarf. Dwarves were uh, frequently seen at the Spanish court. The dwarf holds a rattle and a, an apple, whereas Balthazar Carlos has his hand on the hilt of his sword, as all two-year-olds do, and the other hand holds a stick of command. He was the sole male heir, but he didn't live long enough to inherit the kingdom. So he's about two here. Here's his equestrian portrait, age six. Here he's going hunting, age seven, and more formal, again, age seven. And here he's about 10 or 11 years old. So you can see why, when he was allowed for the first time to go to Italy, Velazquez went in for very simplified garments, a rather austere, nearly abstract setting, and some beautiful semi-nude bodies. On his second and last trip to Spain, clearly tired of painting the royal portraits, he threw caution to the winds and painted his first and only nude woman, known as the Rockby Venus after the English country house where this painting hung for many years. I've preserved her modesty here, since this is supposed to be about readings for the church, and I admit I've wandered a bit far afield. So let's get back on track. Here is a manuscript illumination from the 13th century of Joseph being sent by his father, Jacob, to go find his brothers in the fields in the upper left then stripped of his precious coat and thrown into a well by his brothers. On the upper right, he is sold to the Ishmaelite traders on their way to Egypt, and you then see him subsequently heading off on a camel whose feet wonderfully break the frame. And on the lower left, the brothers show Joseph's blood-stained coat to Jacob, who is clearly distraught. On the bottom right is a scene that falls outside of our readings for today. It's a scene of Joseph when he has risen to a position of some prominence working for an Egyptian captain named Potiphar. Unfortunately, Potiphar's wife fell in love with Joseph, and when he spurned all her advances, she seized on an occasion when they were alone to throw herself at him and when he spurned her yet again and started to run away, she took hold of his coat and kept it as he took off. Then she used the coat as evidence that he had attacked her. And Joseph was imprisoned in a tower where we see him in a subsequent episode in the corner on the lower right with two other prisoners, a baker and a cupbearer. Now, there are a number of things that make this manuscript fascinating beyond the beauty of its illuminations. Originally, this manuscript was in book form, but the original cover has been lost. It illustrated 346 episodes from the Bible. The scenes are all selected from the Old Testament and focus on important heroes from Israel's history, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samson, Samuel, Saul, Jonathan, and King David, all offering models of kinship, kingship excuse me, to avoid or to be followed. You'll notice that the scenes and the costumes, especially in the next slide I show you, are not those of the Holy Land, but rather of 13th century France, where the manuscript originated. Most scholars assume that it was commissioned by King Louis IX, who became Saint Louis, 
because the materials used in making it were extremely costly, something only a king could afford, and the focus is on monarchy. One of the principal reasons for the manuscript's existence is to focus on kingship and the institution of monarchy itself, to show that the Bible sanctions it and that the French monarchy is the earthly manifestation and continuation of this divine right of kings in the new Jerusalem. The second reason for the creation of this manuscript was to legitimize the idea of the French participation in the Crusades, making the warriors that you will see, who were biblical heroes, look and dress exactly like the Crusaders did, was a way to persuade the viewer that crusading was something the biblical heroes engaged in as well. King Louis was obsessed with obtaining relics from the Holy Land and did, in fact, manage to obtain what was alleged to be the crown of thorns that Jesus wore, as well as a fragment of wood and a nail from the true cross, both housed now in Notre Dame in Paris. These, as well as the two crusades that King Louis led against Islam, helped bolster his claim to the throne and to the sanctity of his kingship. You'll notice that in this image of the anointing of Saul to the kingship, King Saul has a scepter topped with the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, and the chain mail that all his soldiers wear in the image above Saul is exactly what French soldiers wore at that time. Don't you love the man hanging onto the rope from the catapult at the top, which was certainly not an instrument of war used by the Israelites. King Saul is also sitting on the same seat of rule that the French had borrowed from the ancient Romans. It's called the Sella Carulis, the seat of the magistrate or the highest government official. Here is what the French imitation of the Roman model looks like. And in fact, Napoleon used this. And it's exactly like what King Saul is sitting on. Basically, the purpose of this beautiful illuminated manuscript is propaganda. Other monarchs or dignitaries who might see it would come away with the idea that the French monarchy and the Crusades led by the French king were good and saintly undertakings or institutions that were perfectly in keeping with biblical precedent. Originally, the manuscript was simply a picture book, but you will notice that there are now three forms of writing around the edges of the page, Latin, Persian, and Judeo-Persian. It's thought that when King Louis died, the manuscript went to his brother, Charles of Anjou, who had conducted a number of military campaigns in Italy and was crowned king there in 1266. While he was in Italy, the manuscript received a Latin commentary, which attempted to describe what was happening in each illustration. After this, the whereabouts of the manuscript is unknown. The first owner we hear about definitively is a cardinal of the church in Poland who had studied for the ministry in Italy and probably came into possession of the manuscript there. The cardinal then gifted the manuscript to Shah Abbas, the king of Persia. The Shah, with the help of some Christian missionaries, had a Persian interpretation of the scenes added to the manuscript sometimes at variance with the Latin interpretation. While it was in his possession, several sheets were removed, all having to do with Absalom's rebellion against his father, King David. It's thought that the Shah didn't want his son to get any revolutionary ideas. The manuscript subsequently went missing when the capital of Persia came under siege and at some point it came into the possession of a Persian Jew who added a Judeo-Persian commentary to the manuscript and corrected some of the errors of the previous interpretations. 
Finally, it was auctioned off at Sotheby's and eventually ended up in the hands of the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York, where it remains to this day. So we're indebted to two kings today, King Philip IV of Spain and King Louis IX of France, for the two main images we've looked at, recording the story of Joseph and his richly ornamented coat. Next week, we will see him many years later, reunited with the brothers who had sold him into slavery. Until then, be well, be safe, be blessed, and we'll meet again next week. <laughs>